<laughs> Next selection will be number 667. 667. There is power in the blood. <clears throat> Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's side. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Will you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of Next selection be number 694. <coughs> 694. <coughs> to Canaan's land, I'm on my way. <coughs> to Canaan's land, I'm on my way, where the soul never dies. My darkest night will turn to day where the soul never dies. No sad farewells, no tear dim eyes. Where all is love and the soul never dies. to that. 
that fair land where the soul never dies, where there will be no parting hand, where the soul never dies, no sad farewells, no tear dim dies, where Invitation song will be number 694. <clears throat> the Civil War in this country must have been a mo most horrifying thing to, to see and visit. The battlefield, we seeing those things happening and realizing that so many people, even some on the north, some on the south, were related to one another, and the horrible way in which they took one another's lives. The horrible reason that it occurred, but it did. It ended April 9th of 1865, and three years later, a day was set aside that would be called Memorial Day or Decoration Day to remember the dead soldiers on, from the North and from the South. And so tomorrow is Memorial Day in this country to remember those who died in battle. And I think it's a good thing to do that. I appreciate those who have given their lives as police officers, as military men and women even today, to take care of and to protect this country. It's good to remember that. It's good to appreciate things people do on behalf of other people. And I wanted to think about some memorials today that are given to us in the Bible. I'm calling the lesson Things to Remember and Some Memorials. The first one that I can remember being mentioned is the rainbow that God set in the sky after the, no the flood of Noah's day. <clears throat> it's interesting how that all the colors we know come from those colors in the rainbow by the blending of them or they stand alone. That rainbow does not stand for what a lot of people are using it for in our day and time to support sin but to establish a promise from God that he would never flood the earth again. That memorial still stands. I love to see the rainbow. You ever out somewhere sometime and say, can you see the rainbow? I remember one time I was in Nicaragua as I recall and they had a terrible, terrible flood back in 1998 and a lot of people died, and in Honduras as well. And I remember I was driving or riding, and I could see the beginning and the end of a rainbow. And, and it just reminded me, while those areas of Honduras and Nicaragua were flooded, God said the whole earth will never be flooded again. And it won't be, because God keeps his promises. So I think of that, and I think we have a promise-keeping God. If you want to note that as a memorial, we have a promise-keeping God. He's not going to lie. He will do what he says he's going to do. And, and I can't help but think about Noah and his family as they would see that. And, of course, they survived it. And I, I know if I'd been on that ark, I'd have been a thankful soul. But I was in the ark, and I was not in the flood, and it died. Another covenant that God made was, was with Abraham. And if you want to go with me to Genesis chapter 17, there are a couple of things in that particular section of Scripture that are worthy of note. We know that God called Abraham of Ur of the Chaldees to leave his family, and he would go to a land that God would show him. And a part of that particular uh, arrangement had to do with the covenant, verse 2, of chapter 17 of Genesis, I will establish my covenant between me and you 
and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be a father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but you, your name shall be Abraham, which means a father of nations, for a father of a multitude, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. And then you pick up down here in verse 10 where he speaks to him of the covenant of circumcision. So there are two promises going on here, and one would be that Abram would remember that covenant. You and I know that the fulfillment of that covenant was ultimately the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ through the genealogies from Abraham all the way down through the genealogy of Joseph and then, of course, the genealogy of Mary. Christ came into the world because of this promise. What a precious covenant promise that God made through this man. And of all those people, there would only be one that would ultimately fulfill that covenant. And then the covenant of circumcision, beginning with verse 10, this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you, every male among you shall be circumcised. And we understand what that's about. And then, of course, he said those who, uh, if there was an uncircumcised male, verse 14, that is not, who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from among his people. He has broken my covenant. Now bear in mind that that covenant of circumcision was given to Jews and Jews only. You go and you read the Paul's letter to the church of Galatia, the churches of Galatia, you read the Acts chapter 15, that circumcision was not a part of Christianity. The Jews tried to bring it in, and, and you go and read the first part of the letter to the Galatians, and Paul talks about corrupting or any other gospel which was not preached. If anybody preaches any other gospel that's not preached, let them be accursed. He was particularly talking about trying to make circumcision by the Jews as a law for Christians. There are other principles in that. However, circumcision distinguished God's people from the other people in the world. You remember when David stood before Goliath that he called him an uncircumcised Philistine? That was not complimentary, was it? But he was saying, you're not one of us. You're not part of God's people. That covenant of circumcision distinguished God's people from others. And it was so it was something to remember and to, to remind them that they belonged, that they belonged to God. You'll also remember when the children of Israel were in Egyptian bondage. God had his reason for that, and, and it was a part of uh, disciplining those people. But he said, I'm going to bring you out. I'll bring you out. And you go read Exodus chapter 12, where God establishes what we, would, what we know of as the Passover and then in the latter part of the chapter, beginning with verse 14, you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We know that God sent ten plagues into that part of the world, in Egypt at that time. And he had told the children of Israel they were to take a lamb, they were to kill the lamb and take the blood and with hyssop and put it on the lentils over the door and on the doorpost. And then that night, their children would be protected. Their firstborn would be protected from death. We also know that the firstborn of the children of Israel were protected from death. The firstborn of the Egyptians all died, including the firstborn of their animals. They were to, the children of Israel were to keep that Passover until, and of course forever for them as a nation, as a reminder that God protected them from death and that he brought them out of the land of Egypt. I think it would have been a very wonderful experience to go back in time and be with the children of Israel as they would actually carry out this Passover and to see it in person. I know the scriptures give us explanations as to how it was done, but it's kind of like the difference in reading the book and watching the movie, as it were. I think it would be interesting and too interesting to hear them talk. Said, yes, talking to a son. Said, son, this, this is a reminder that God brought us out of Egypt. 
that he protected us. And that's why we're alive today. And, and, and he wants us to remember this. And they did it one time every year as a part of their, of their celebration for, for being delivered. It was to be done on the 15th day of the month of Nisan, or Nisan, however they would pronounce that, corresponding to our months of March or April. And of course it was just uh, about, about right at the time when also when our Lord Jesus died. He died at the Passover. He became the Passover lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, the Revelation writer would tell us. We'll come back to that in just a moment. In the Bible, there are types and there are antitypes. The antitype is always greater than the type. The type here, the Passover lamb, and then the antitype was Jesus, who is represented figuratively as a lamb, and his blood paid the price for sin. The animal sacrifices could not do that, and we'll come around to that also in a moment. But it was a type, the Passover was a type of the death of Christ and also a type of what we know of as the Lord's Supper. The children of Israel were also given the Sabbath as a day to remember. Of, and, and it's very interesting how people today view the Sabbath. In Exodus 20 and verse 7, God in, in that list of what we call the Decalogue said, Remember the Sabbath. To keep it holy. God had Sabbath laws for the children of Israel to follow. They could not, they were not supposed to work and, and to do farming and things like that on the Sabbath. It was a day of rest for them. A day for them to, to remember that God had delivered them. Somebody says, now, now I thought that the Sabbath was a reminder that God rested on the seventh day. To some degree, that's true, but turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 5 as what we have a reiteration or the giving of the law the second time to a different generation of people by God's servant Moses. It was not a second law, it was a giving of the law again. Remember, everybody wasn't running around with a copy of the Bible in their hands. These these. Laws were written down, but not everybody had their own copies. They had to rely on the, the priests and others to read them to them. But I want you to notice an explanation that God gave through Moses to the children of Israel. I want to begin with verse 12. Observe of the Deuteronomy 5. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as your Lord God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You, nor your son, your daughter, or your male servant, or your female servant, or your ox, or your donkey, or any of your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you, so that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well. Now, practically speaking, Every, we need a day off during the week. And I'm sure they worked much harder than many of us do. Some of you may work as hard as they did, I couldn't say. But they had to, everything was done by hand. They had no machinery. Everything was hard work. But I want you to notice what God says in verse 15. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So there were two basic features of, of the Sabbath. One was a day of rest, so they could recoup their energy. The other was to remember that God delivered them from Egypt. It's also interesting that the Sabbath day was never given to anybody except the Hebrew people. They weren't called Jews until the, the, the southern kingdom was established. And, of course, they became Judah. Then they began to be called Jews. Prior to that, they were called Hebrews or the children of Israel. We don't celebrate the Sabbath. There's nothing in Christianity about the Sabbath. The Sabbath was never given to a Gentile. It's not a part of Christianity. 
And Paul makes it very clear that, that and of course we know that the early church was, was made up of, first in the first place, by Jewish people who converted to Christianity and become Christians. And naturally, they didn't just want to bring circumcision into the church. They also wanted to maintain some of their other things. Now, let me make this clear. For a Jewish person to keep the Sabbath would not have been wrong. But to insist that it be done because that it was for everybody, that's, that would have been the problem. There were some of the things that the Jews could continue to celebrate in some ways and yet not force that on others. Certainly they would want to remember that as a people that God delivered them from the Egyptians. But the Sabbath day is no longer a holy day. And I want you to notice in Colossians chapter 2, beginning with verse 16, Paul tells the Christians in Colossae, therefore no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. In other words, you Gentiles, the, the Jews can't judge you on keeping these things. Notice what he says, and here you have different wording, but you go back to the idea of a type and an antitype. Moses was a type of Christ. He was a preacher, he was a deliverer, and, and so, but he wasn't Jesus, and he certainly wasn't as great, and, and, and that Solomon was a type of Christ, and that Solomon was wisdom, but Jesus at one point said a greater than Solomon is here. The antitype's always greater. Now, notice verse 17. Things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And so the keeping of the Sabbath was never brought into Christianity. While the Jews might maintain some of those things to remember, God brought our people out. I think if I were Jewish today, I would kind of celebrate that to some degree if I had that heritage. But it's not what I do as a Christian. And it certainly could not be imposed on the Gentiles. And there's no such thing in Scripture as in Sunday being called a Christian Sabbath. That is secular terminology. It's not biblical terminology. The Lord's day is the day that Jesus came forth from the grave. And you read that in the conclusion of the gospel records in Revelation chapter 1. John said he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, obviously talking about Sunday. We take up the collection on the first day of the week, according to 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. And then Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, we read how the church where Paul was meeting with them in Miletus, that they were, they came together on the first day of the week to break bread. There's no mention in the New Testament about the early church honoring the Sabbath as God's people, but the first day of the week. And that's a wonderful thing to think about. Can you think of anything greater that's important to you and to me other than <clears throat> Jesus paying the price for sin than Jesus coming out of that grave alive? Some of us probably have thought about death, especially if you get a grave illness, you think very seriously about it. And you think, well, you know, and, and everybody's probably at least a little bit afraid of it. Even though you may be a strong, faithful Christian, you're probably a little bit, I know I'd be a little bit afraid of it because I've never experienced it. And I know that once you die, you don't come back. Except resurrection's been promised. Jesus came out of the grave alive. That was a key point that the Apostle Peter made in Acts chapter 2 that he's sitting at God's right hand, that he was alive. Now, what do we remember as God's people? We can remember the rainbow because that's a promise from God for all people from Genesis 9, or, or that time of Noah, and, and until Jesus comes again. None of those other covenants have anything to do with us, and there was one that I passed over Either that or I'm not following my notes. In, in Numbers chapter 15, verses 38 through 40, if you want to note that, that the children of Israel were to, the, the men were to put tassels on the hems of their garments. 
And notice, beginning with verse 38 of Numbers 15, make that they were to make for themselves tassels on the corners of their garments throughout the generations, and that they shall not, <clears throat> I'm sorry, they shall put on the tassel of each corner a cord of blue. It shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord. Why did you need those tassels? It wasn't necessarily decoration but a reminder, something to remind them. When they go into the land of Egypt, not only were they circumcised as an identification of God's people, but they were to put these, these men, put tassels on the corners of their garments to let other people know, no, first of all, to let them know to keep God's commandments. Every time they looked at that tassel, they would be reminded, we're supposed to be doing what God said. And, of course, it also separated them from the other people. But he says, this, it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord so as to do them and not follow after your own heart and your own eyes after which you played the harlot so that you may remember to do all my commandments and be holy to your God. They were to remember... God, as they went into the land of Canaan, keeping their commandments, also in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 and following, that God reminds them to keep all of God's commandments, and all the commandments that I'm commanding you today shall be, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord your God swore to give to your forefathers. You remember how that was promised earlier? Even to Abraham, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. In other words, when you go into the land of Canaan, you need to remember by being circumcised, have the tassels on your garments, and you remember what I did for you. I, we, I brought you out of the land of Canaan. There is no way, as to use a figure of speech, one of my uh, brothers who's passed on now, he said there's no way under the shining canopy of God they could have gotten themselves out of Egypt alone. God had to do it. And so when they went into the land of Canaan, you need to remember who your God is who brought you out. It's good to remember God, Amen. It's necessary to remember God because the world's not going to remind you of God for the most part. But we have to do it ourselves. Now, none of these things necessarily apply to us today except the rainbow. How about Joshua? Joshua chapter 4. The memorial stones that were set up as a memorial that God's priest walked across the Jordan on dry ground. And at the time that Joshua was written, we read it in Joshua 4, that the stones were still there at that time as a memorial that God that allowed the priest to carry the Ark of the Covenant across the Jordan River on dry ground. God was taking care of his covenant. And remember, who did that? I don't know about you, or maybe I do. I need to remember the good things that God has done for me over the years. And the longer we live, the more things we have to remember. Let us not ever take our God for granted and what he's done for us and what he continues to do for us. And you talk about a memorial. We visited the Lincoln Memorial uh, when we were in Washington. Uh, we've been there twice. And, and I think of the people in this nation that, that deserve to be memorialized, to have done things to help people, to, to try to help people out of difficult situations. You may not necessarily agree with all of the things that, that they believed in, but their overall cause, like Martin Luther King, he had a purpose to help the black people. I admire him for trying to help those people. I admire the people like Lincoln who didn't want war in this country. I admire our soldiers who will go to Afghanistan and some to the Gulf War and like folks like my dad in the early 50s who went to Korea. He didn't want to go, but he said, it was my duty to go. 
when he was dying, the, the local army people in Chattanooga wanted to give him a, a little recognition. He said, I, I don't want that. He said, I did what I was supposed to do, and, and that's good enough for me. But they just insisted, and they came in and gave him a little plaque because they wanted to show some appreciation because some of the guys didn't come home from Korea. A lot of our young men didn't come home from uh, Vietnam. That's a horrible, horrible war period for our nation. Stupid war. And people look back on it and know that now. But you got to admire those who, who, who went through it and, and stood up for what they thought at least was right to, to that degree. But there's one person that stands out above all of these. And that's our Lord. That's Jesus Christ. Everything he stood for was right. Nothing he stood against did not need to be stu stood against. Jesus was God in the flesh. He comes to this earth to help you and me survive the, not only the harsh, foolish results of sin, but the penalty of it, which is condemnation by God, to come here and take away the guilt of sin so that when we hear the gospel and we believe it and we repent and we confess Christ and we're baptized for the remission of our sins and we're forgiven, Jesus made that possible. I'm afraid sometimes we emphasize the doctrine and not, don't emphasize the, the doctrine giver like we should. I am not downplaying the doctrine of Christ, but at the same time, it's Jesus that made it possible for there to even be a teaching. For you to get out of this, how many of you are better off than you were a few years ago because you're living for the Lord? How many of you are better off than you were a week ago because of something you've come through? Jesus made it possible, but the ultimate thing when he died was his sacrifice on Calvary's cross. And the Apostle Paul would tell us in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26, we remember his death until he comes. That will stand until Jesus comes again. The record of the Lord's Supper is found in Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29. In Mark chapter 14, 12 through 25. Luke 14 through 20. Again, Matthew 26, 26 through 29, Mark 14, 12 through 25, Luke 14 through 20, Luke 14, 22, 14 through 20. I left part of it out. And then it kind of happens in John 13, but the emphasis in John 13 is about the Lord serving after the supper. The discussion in John chapter 6 is not about the Lord's supper. It's about Jesus preaching to Jews to accept his death. They were going to have a hard time with that. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. You're going to have to accept me or you don't have any life. But what about those who have accepted Christ? Who have made him their Lord and made him their Savior. Confess his precious name like he's commanded us to do in Matthew 20, 28, Matthew 23, and and how that the eunuch did that, reading from Isaiah the prophet in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And when Philip got to a certain point, he said, well, what, what hinders me from being baptized? And, and Philip said, well, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And Philip and the eunuch went down in the water, and he baptized him. Now, what did that eunuch do? And what did all Christians do after that in the first century? They remembered the Lord's death through the Lord's Supper. It's a precious memorial to remember his death until he comes. I want to spend a minute or two in Luke's gospel. I'm afraid sometimes, and I talked to somebody about this in a congregation I was visiting recently, and I probably need to call this brother because I might not have come across the way I wanted to. But I was asking them, I said, please spend more time with the Lord's Supper. I, the early church came together on the first day of the week to make the announcements. No, the early church came together on the first day of the week to sing, I'd say they did. 
they came together to preach. I know Paul did, Acts 20, verse 7. But they came together to break bread. Their purpose for coming together was to remember the death of Christ, and then there are many other elements involved. We should never make the Lord's Supper a checkoff event. Well, I took the Lord's Supper today. How about you commune with the Lord through the Lord's Supper? That's what you're reading about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that the bread and the body are a communion or a fellowship with the Lord. <clears throat> Jesus instituted this in Luke chapter 22, beginning with verse 14. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Luke is the only one who gives those words. I have earnestly desired this. Now I want to pause here and I want you to think about this. Why well, they've taken the pass have been involved in the Passover for years, since the days of Moses. The this was the last Passover that God recognized. Why? Because Jesus was about to die. That old Passover would die with it. But then Jesus says, I have earnestly desired to do this because what he's saying, I want to show you ultimately what Passover really means. And you know, you and I know that he passed over the firstborn and, and, and that Jesus dying for us, he's passing over sin when we become Christians. It's one thing to die physically, it's another thing to die spiritually. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Look at the timing. For I say to you, I shall never eat of it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. That would have happened on the day of Pentecost. Listen, Jesus is at the right hand of God, but he's also with us when we participate and we commune with him through the Lord's Supper. He knows he died. He knows what happened. He's not dying again. But he knows that we're remembering what he did for us. And spiritually speaking, he's right here with us when we do that. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. In Mark's account, it says he was given a cup. Nonetheless, for I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread, to be unleavened bread from the Passover and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The Bible uses figures of speech and, and a simile is something that's similar. It's like something. A metaphor is stronger than a simile. A metaphor is like this is my marriage. That means, that says I'm married. That's not really my marriage, but it's such a strong symbol. It says I'm married, doesn't it? That fruit, that bread is such a strong symbol. It's not literally the body of Christ, but Jesus uses a metaphor that says this is my body. He wants us to remember his body. Oh, how he suffered on that cross. Needlessly, as far as some people go, he didn't have to, but then it was a part of the commandment of God that he do that. I want you to remember what I did for you, and I'm going to use a little bit of bad English. That ain't nothing. <clears throat> that, that coming out of Egypt ain't nothing compared to what he did for us on the cross, to emphasize it. It doesn't even come close. That deliverance doesn't even come close to the deliverance that we have from sin because Jesus died. Then his blood, which was shed for many, Matthew says in verse 28 and Matthew 26, for the remission of sins. This blood, this cup, it's not the cup, but the cup represents, the contents represent something. This cup represents something. There's your metaphor again. This cup is the new covenant. It's not the old covenant. It's the new covenant. What's in that new covenant that wasn't in that old covenant? The remission of sins. <clears throat> How can a person 
live a wicked, sinful life all week and sit down and drink the cup of the Lord as if they have not done so. Now let me qualify that. We are none of us is worthy of it, but we need to be living in such a way that we're trying to be what God wants us to. We're trying to live as we should, and that was part of the problem in Corinth. They turned the Lord's Supper into a common meal. And he says, if you, if you drink it in an unworthy manner, you bring condemnation on yourself. And he did, so there's none of us perfect, but surely when I do this, I need to have a desirous heart, brethren, to appreciate what Jesus did. I've gone through this past week just like you have, and I have sinned. But every time I recognize it, I ask God to forgive me, and I come here, and I come here with you in the presence of the Lord, and I remember why I can even pray that prayer. That Jesus died. He, he, his body, he suffered. The blood was shed. He said, it's given for you. This do. Do this in remembrance of me. And he says that in, in regard to the bread, it's obvious with the fruit of the vine. I don't really care for that as a meal. God didn't give it as a meal. He gave it as a memorial to remember. Who should partake of the Lord's Supper? Children of God. Those who have died to the practice of sin who have been buried with Christ in baptism, rising to walk in newness of life. It does not belong to anybody else. It does not belong to the infidel. It does not belong to the person who is not a child of God. How can a person remember what God has done for them if they've not even recognized what God has done for them? But when I do, what a precious moment that is. How precious it ought to be. I don't know that we need to spend 30 minutes on it, but I wouldn't get mad if somebody did. But think about it. That's why we're even here. Because Jesus died, was buried, and was rose again. This first day of the week belongs to him. Let us remember him in a moment through the Lord's Supper. And remember, Jesus did this as an innocent, loving lamb who laid his life down that he might take it again. He would say in John 10, and he said, I can do this. The Father gave me the right to do this. I'm paraphrasing it. He says, the Father gave me the power to lay it down. In other words, I didn't have to do it. But precious people, he did. And I'm so thankful he did. Let's remember him this morning. If you need to respond to the invitation, please come as we stand and say. Correction song number number 763, why keep Jesus waiting? Number 763. <laughs> why keep Jesus waiting? Waiting in the cold. He will bear you gently, gently to his fold. See him so.
next song will be number 203. Number 203. Hallelujah. What a Savior. <coughs> Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. day of the week again and we have come to the portion of our service that we have set aside to remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we had a wonderful wonderful message this morning on why and how we came about the Lord's Supper this morning we're going to take our scripture from the book of Corinthians and we're going to read from the 11th chapter and we'll start at verse 23 and we will read. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We will ask Brother Tony to say a blessing to the bread. Bow with me. Dear Lord, we are so thankful to be here this morning to be able to commune with the Lord and think about what he did for us. We are thankful for the message, dear God, as where our hearts and our minds are on Jesus at this time. Help us, Heavenly Father, to remember when we partake of this bread, the, the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. It should have been us, and we're so thankful for that. We praise in Christ's name. Amen.
pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we would ask you to bless this cup, Father. This cup, which represents the blood of your Son, who died on the cross for our sins. We pray this in your Son's name, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Now, separate and apart from the Lord's Supper is our opportunity to give back a portion, for we know the Lord loves a cheerful giver. This morning, our scripture for our, the collection for the saints will be taken from the book of Corinthians, in the 16th chapter, and we'll start reading at verse one, number one. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there will be no collections when I come. <clears throat> let us pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we would ask you to bless this offering, Father. We pray that we use these funds in accordance with your will further your kingdom here on earth, Father. We pray all these things in your Son's name, in Jesus Christ. wonderful service we've had this morning. I know I can take what I've learned here today and think about it through the week. Uh, we also got another announcement. There's a, a prayer request for uh, Perry Webb, uh, Sammy's son. He's having carpal tunnel <coughs> surgery on his right wrist on the 6-1 uh, uh, a few weeks later on the, the left wrist. So he's going to have two, two uh, operations, one on each wrist. So let's keep him in our prayers. I can, uh, Brenda's having an anniversary tomorrow. Let's think of them, and uh, it's good to, good to see them here this morning, and good for the uh, service that they provide each week. Thankful for everyone that's here. Congratulations. If there's nothing further, remember our uh, 5 o'clock uh, evening service, and uh, if you would, bow with me at this time. Dear God in heaven, we, we're so thankful to be here this morning. We're Thankful, dear God, for the message that we've heard. We pray, dear God, that we'll think of what Jesus has done for us and how great a sacrifice it is. And there's nothing better than that, that we receive, dear God, for forgiveness through his, precious, through his precious blood. We're so thankful for that. We pray, dear God, for all those that's on the sick and prayer list that we've mentioned this day. We 
pray that you'll be with them and continue to be with them. We pray with uh, pray for Perry at this time also, dear God, that you'll be with those that do the surgery on his wrist and that he'll have a speedy recovery. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with us in our in this community when we when we go to our places, our, our, where we work and where we come in contact with people, dear God. Help us to let our light shine. And we know, dear God, that you love everyone. We can we know that by the scriptures that we are to love one another and have the same love that you have towards our fellow brethren and also for fe fellow people that we are in contact with. Help us, dear God, to have the opportunity to lead others to you. And we know, dear God, is, that's what you'd want us to do. We pray that you'll forgive us of all our sins. In the end, give us a home in heaven with you. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <coughs>